I've heard of flow batteries, I've heard of all sorts of batteries, but never a rust battery. If we're going to be dealing with these low cycling uh, problems, we need it to be very, very cheap. And what, what impact must that have on the spread of prices you've got to capture? Fundamentally, what we are trying to deal with is how to uh, store huge oversupplies of renewables at certain times. Well, I was going to ask you about that, right? That rusting process, which is the changing of the composition of that iron, frees up that electron. And what you're doing with that electron, that electron wants to go somewhere else, and that is the discharge process, essentially. I don't know, like a 19th century science experiment with big like glass bulbs and, and what, what's going on? We need to understand variability hour to hour, day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year, yet things change, right? Hello everybody, Quentin here. This week we've got an interview with David Hill from Form Energy. Now if you haven't heard of them, they're pretty big in the US, they've got a new battery chemistry, and they're specifically looking at long duration stuff. So we go down the rabbit hole of long duration energy storage, what that means, and how these new technologies can provide it. I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you guys do too. And please do hit like, subscribe, and let us know what you think in the comments. Let's start from the top. We're talking about, on this podcast, we're talking about two new things. We're talking about a new type of battery, yep. and we're talking about long duration batteries, both of which are um, brand new, if you like, to our industry, and a big part of what the future might look like. So where should we start? Should we start with the long duration bit or the form energy bit? Because batteries from rust <laughs> could be, um, well, it's, it's very exciting technology. <laughs> Um, but I'm not really sure how it works. Let's do the let's do the rust thing first. So form energy. What is form energy? So yeah, I think it's good to start with form because generally the origin stories of form were the main reason I joined. It's quite a, a captivating story because the five founders who came together back in 2017, who all collectively have worked in the lithium ion or short duration space for each of them up to a decade. So there's a huge wealth of experience across technology development and commercialization and operations. They all were looking to solve essentially the same problem, which was that there was a recognition that lithium is a great technology. It's a very powerful technology. You know, you mean you know it very well. Most of your listeners know it very well. Um, and essentially, it has solved that sort of within day problem and the sort of very, the issues that arise from the instability of grid, so being able to provide the range of different frequency services. And if you pair that with wind, solar, both offshore, onshore, different types, we can do a lot with just those sort of three technologies, essentially. We can get to maybe 70, 80 percent renewables at a sort of at a sort of cost effective level. It is that last 30 to 20 percent that is really hard. And there is this fundamental technology gap. So that's the area they wanted to focus start. Like what would be the type of energy storage that would enable us to provide a round the clock, reliable, renewable energy system in a cost effective way? And they came to a couple of conclusions. Well, essentially what they were trying to do was build a battery spec and then sort of work backwards from there and find out what would be the type of chemistry to enable that specification. So let's just nail that down for a second. So what we're we talking about, what sort of duration, is it around the clock? What, what, does that, what does that mean? Yeah, so I think it's a really good question. And I think uh, as a new industry, I think we already suffer from a little bit of a, a definition problem because long is inherently an imprecise term. So mm -hmm. when what we call about long is we talk about multi-day storage. So it's more specifically, we're looking at 100 hours. This but is not, so that's not seasonal storage, that's a no. different thing, right? No, and actually I think some of the original thesis of the company was, does it need to be seasonal? And that was what we looked at. And essentially by the kind of, yeah, as I said, the beginnings of the company was much more around data modeling and power system modeling as opposed to getting in the lab. Like figure out what the system needs first and then get in the lab and figure out how to make it up. And modeling lots of different power systems around the world, some more wind dominant, some more solar dominant. We came to the conclusion that you do need almost at least 100 hours to be able to ride out these lulls in renewable energy patterns, deal with massive oversupply at sort of transmission level, and you know increasingly in certain parts of the world dealing with extreme weather events. And so, okay. and this 100 hours uh, really covers sort of rides you through most of those occurrences, but they are very infrequent, right? So they they happen maybe a couple of times a year. They might happen might not happen for a couple of years. And so the majority of the time, what you find when we do these optimization problems for our different clients around the world is most of the time you're actually doing more seasonal shifting because you're sort of slowly charging the battery up 
over a sort of a period of months where the system might be net long. And then you're sort of slowly charging the battery, uh, discharging the battery over a period of time when the system is you know, net short of power. So it has the ability to sort of do both. You can deal with these sort of rare events to discharge the battery at full rated power for the full 100 hours for the full four days, or you do this sort of incremental seasonal shifting. So let's get this frame of reference here, right? So there's there's um, lithium ion batteries, there's a load of those already around the world. They're one, two, three, four hour systems. Mm -hmm. And then there's this concept of long, good, you know, long, 100 hours ish. Some people say eight hours is long, right? But 100, <laughs> 100 hours, so that's, um, my math isn't great, but I know that's four days yep. of, of power. And then there's the seasonal storage, which is the, um, when it's sunny in the summer, I'm very much simplifying here, but sunny in the summer, charge the batteries, not sunny so much in the winter, discharge the batteries, and a load of other complexities around that. And so we're saying that form energy and the rust battery, which I can't wait to get to, <laughs> um, I've heard of flow batteries, I've heard of all sorts of batteries, but never a rust battery. The, the form energy thing is around the 100 hours, but it's also capable of doing longer as well. Yes, in the sense that you you have 100 hours to discharge at full rated capacity. So that means literally discharging the battery full rated for four days straight. The occurrences of when that is needed in the system. So again, if you think systematically, when you go through lulls, uh, a lull is sort of, again, is something that you have to define of what a lull means against sort of below a certain average uh, mm -hmm. level at a certain time of year. Again, that won't be sort of a very low for that whole four days. So you will rare events where you find yourself fully discharging that battery over a full four days. So what you might find yourself doing is discharging a little bit for some days, a little bit again another day. And so you are providing that sort of incremental seasonal storage because you could have charged that up sort of a month earlier as the sort of, again, you might be going through a period of time where the, there is more wind on the system than is currently needed. Yeah. For the, I guess the, the problem with the seasonal case, um, man, there's a lot to talk about today. The problem <laughs> with the seasonal case is if you're going to charge one season and sell, if you're going to buy power in one season and sell it back in another season, that's not many cycles. You need a yeah. really big spread, yeah. a price spread, to make it worth doing very few cycles. Yes, I think it's actually probably more important to look at the cost. You need it to be really cheap. Or you need it to be really cheap, yeah. So yeah, this, yeah. Is the, this is where the sort of, again, the origin stories of form comes in, which was when they recognize that it needs to be 100 hours, they also recognize it needs to be an order of magnitude cheaper than anything else on the market at a dollar per kilowatt hour, sort of pounds per kilowatt hour level, to enable this type of optimization problem to happen because if you're not cycling the battery very often because it's predominantly a capacity asset or a resource adequacy asset to deal with these uh, you know, rarer events, you need it to be very cheap to be able to sort of compensate for the fact that these are like much less cycling assets than say lithium ion, which is going one or two times a day. Okay, let's come back to form, right? So yeah. what is form energy? How many people is it? Um, where is it based? And you said that it was founded in 2017. You know, how, how much has it grown since then? And what's the what's the vision here? So, I mean, the vision is building energy storage for a better world. And it generally is meaning that how we can use the sort of power of, a, you know, energy storage to expedite our, our sort of pathway to net zero in the most cost effective way. And that was what really bound a lot of the founders together. And as I said, they didn't want to just get in the lab and look at different chemistry types and then think, oh, that stores energy. Let's find our application for that. They really want to say, no, what is the problem? The problem is we need to be able to store energy for multiple days and it needs to be cost effective. So they came together in 2017 and they didn't actually select iron air as the chemistry first. They sort of had a few different ideas. They liked the iron air. Yeah, sorry, I should go back to that. But they didn't actually choose the rusting sort of part of the battery initially. They sort of looked at the sort of system and said, what do we need? And then they did a bit of a feasibility study on a bunch of different chemistries. And essentially what they needed, they wanted to find out was it needs to be cheap, it needs to be safe, it needs to be scalable and it needs to be durable. And so fundamentally, the only sort of elements that could provide all of these things was this iron air chemistry. So let's talk a bit about the, I guess, the technology. So the technology is, and like, <laughs> I am not a material scientist, you know that. So I'm going to keep this at a pretty high level, but it yep. is fundamentally a reversible rust battery. You have a reversible rust, a reversible rust. So the ability to rust and then unrust metal and rust. Yeah. So we're talking about normal brown, nasty rust that comes on steel that hasn't been treated. Uh, yes and no, but essentially, okay. yes. So you, you've got a iron anode, right? And the iron anode is the in the thickness of that iron anode is the duration of our storage. So you've got a chunk of metal. Yep. And the the thickness of that metal. We're going to figure out how this thing works in a minute. Yep. But 
basics, the thickness of the me metal, how much metal is there, defines how long duration that bit of the battery cell is. Yes. Okay. And so what happens is, is essentially the process of rusting that metal frees sort of that sort of rusting process frees up an electron and that is the discharge process. Ah. And so as we essentially have a cell which is uh, has this what's called this air breathing cathode that brings air into the cell and it mixes with the electrolyte to sort of make the chemical reaction happen and that is the discharge process and we sort of steadily rust that metal throughout the whole discharge process to you know discharge at full rate to power. What does this thing look like? So <laughs> before we get into any more detail, are we in my head it's like I don't know, like a 19th century science experiment with big like glass bulbs and, and what, what's going on? Um, so it so what a module looks like, which is the sort of individual building block of our systems. So at a system level, it will in some way look like very much like a lithium ion sort of um, installation, shipping containers with sort of cell racks of cells. Oh, I'm comfortable now. <laughs> right, as long as there's a shipping container in there. Yeah. Although when I first went to see our R&D lab, it was pretty cool. There was a lot, there were some bubbling test tubes sort of around yeah. the place, which I very much enjoyed. But the, um, so you have, but these, uh, the cells are very different. Our cells are about a meter tall and they're about 60 centimeters wide. And the reason is everything we do, and I will, I will constantly refer back to this, is around cost efficiency, how we can continue to bring down the cost of our system to go back to the problem we said, which is if we're going to be dealing with these low cycling uh, problems, we need it to be very, very cheap. So... Given that the sort of, as I said, the, the, the level of um, duration of our storage is defined by the thickness of the iron anode, we want to essentially maximize that whilst reducing the cost of all the inactive materials. And so that supports our very large cells because that enables us to sort of achieve the chemical reaction the most cost effective. So I'm thinking like an oil drum size. Is that is that about the right size? Yeah, so it's funny, right? So uh, my, my wonderful American colleagues say it's like similar to the size of a sort of a washer and a dryer put together is the side of one of our modules, but that's a very much an American washer. Very much an American washer. Say, yeah, right, a not top a loading. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's a, you know, it's about sort of maybe two meters by one meter is the size of one of our modules, which is okay. this is the individual building block of one of our systems. And then you add them all together, and then you get the long duration. Yeah, and then bit. you get the long duration bit. Um, and what's really interesting in terms of, as I said, the the main active materials and what we do are iron, air, and water. And so that is fundamentally a very, very cheap way of building a chemical, a sort of electrochemical battery. So that hits the sort of the cost part. On the safety part, there is absolutely no inherent risk of thermal runaway because of the chemical reaction that is involved. And then the scalable part, and I think the scalable part is really important because reality is... is well, before we get to scalable, sorry, how do you make electricity out of rust? We seem to have skipped a very important <laughs> bit here. Cause, so lots of batteries, they, they work with you know, some generation types, they use heat or they use steam, or some batteries, you create a voltage across, yeah. you know, the, the, because you've got um, an anode and a cathode and yeah. electrolyte. You know, what, 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 I don't understand how a rust on iron yeah. becomes electricity. So that process, as I said, is, is that rusting process, which is the changing of the composition of that iron, frees up that electron and, and what you're doing with that electron that electron wants to go somewhere else and that is the discharge process essentially so that is creating the discharge and the sort of creation of electricity the smarts of what we've done and that is by the way that is not a we didn't invent that chemistry that was invented by nasa in the 1970s yeah. uh, and that comes back to some of the durability that this type of chemistry has gone through thousands and thousands of cycles. But well, NASA did for, it for mobility purposes. Well, for when I worked in oil and gas, you used to have cathodic protection on steel in um, offshore yeah. platforms. Basically, a big cathode that you would put on a bit of steel to slow down the effect of rusting. It's the same thing, yeah. right? You're either yeah. adding electrons or flip freeing them up one way or another. Exactly. And, so, and then the charging process, uh, we essentially bring electrical current back into the cell and that sort of replaces the hydroxide ions back into the iron anode and returns it to its metallic form, and that is the charging process. So does this, right, this iron goes, <laughs> does it go orange like rust? No. It doesn't? No. So you're not, you're not going orange and then back to no, the previous colour? No, sometimes in our, some of our collateral, we sort of do that to sort of make people sort of understand it, but this is a different type of rust. We're like, we're rusting it from, from the inside, essentially. Rusting it from the inside. Because rust is, rust, I know it's, it's everywhere and it's, you know, it's quite, um, you know, it, it's, it's safe. It's not going to really hurt anyone, but it, it makes you think of problems, right? Rust is a bad thing. <laughs> Rust on, on, you know, on wheel arches, on cars or whatever is not a good thing. But in this case, is it fully reversible or do, yes. does, you know, because 
I think of rust as being flaky bits of metal that sort of yes. get kicked off. So that not like that. No, not at all. So it again, that's the rust of our imagination, and that's the sort of rust that makes us the nervous. Rust of our imagination. <laughs> wow. Yes. <laughs> and that's the rust that makes us nervous of driving over a bridge or something yes. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's not like that at all. It is fundamentally sort of breaking down the sort of chemical composition of that sort of piece of iron, the way we sort of manufacture that iron anode. And what does one of these one meter by sixty centimeter uh, cells produce what, what how, how many kilowatt hours or what hours or megawatt hours is one of those things so one of those cells is about 10 kilowatt hours so again, sort of, yeah so they are sort of again and i think this is the you sort of again get you sort of raise a point which is you know as we sort of go through the technology and all its merits uh we are fundamentally looking at a different footprint size to a lithium ion we are we have a much bigger footprint in terms of our power density, but we have a much better footprint in terms of our energy density. Okay, so you need um, you need more space, basically. Yes. It, yeah. I'm going to have to keep on comparing to lithium ion because yeah. lithium ion's everywhere. So a 40 foot container of lithium ion has got one to two megawatt hours in it, yeah. right? Maybe a bit more if you yeah. squeeze it in. Yeah. 40 foot container, which is a normal shipping container of form energy rust batteries um, is what, something you know, in the sort of 100 kilowatt hour well, yeah, so I guess the way we sort of talk about it is that we're about two to three megawatts per acre. Two to three megawatts per acre. So it's again, so that's so when you think about lithium ion, it's very different. But then when you sort of convert that to energy, we're about 200 to 300 megawatt hours per acre. Okay. So, so in that regard, we are have a better energy density to solar, for instance. instance and, and when you sort of look at the way our installations look at scale, we are much more similar to a solar installation than we are a lithium ion installation. Uh, okay, okay. You know what? This is probably the fifth time someone's come on this podcast and said the word acre, and I still, in my head, I can't figure out what an acre is. But I'm not a farmer; I'm a city boy, so we do square foot. Yeah, yeah, no. It's, uh, it's, well, I think seemingly the the whole develop renewable development. It's not just an American sort of love of imperial metrics. Oh no, no, no. Everyone talks in acres. Let's do, um, let's go back to scalability, yeah. right? So that's one of the big pluses of the form energy system, right? What what does that mean? So what it means is, you know, fundamentally they're is a large amount of investment going on in the whole world of like low carbon firm capacity for us to enable us to roll out the huge amounts of renewables that we need to do to hit all our hit all our decarbonization targets. I guess one of the f challenges is making sure that you it's one thing having sort of tapping into sort of a large supply chain and uh, sort of iron which is very cheap because it's heavily in abundance but it's another thing that the fact it's it's heavily mined it's one of the largest like most mined commodities in the world and so therefore we can tap into an existing supply chain that's already there which is a sort of building block of the steel supply chain that gives us a huge advantage in the sense that we don't have to build up that supply chain as a demand for our product it sort of it begins to wrap up we have all of those existing suppliers that are there so that means that as the sort of demand for our product picks up we can sort of keep pace with that. I can't stop thinking about iron and ion puns. <laughs> there is something there that you guys have got to use. <laughs> there is definitely a, a healthy pun culture within Form Energy. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> so how many people is it? How Four companies are uh, groups of people, right? Yeah. So how, how many people are at Form Energy? Where are they all based? What, what do you do there? <laughs> so we are growing very fast. Uh, we are, I think, about 400. I think we're probably over 400 people now, but we're growing rapidly. The business is... 400 people, wow. Yeah. Wow. So the business is really rapidly moving, you know, you can sort of moving out of the lab into high volume manufacturing to start delivering on our first commercial projects that will go live in the US and over the next couple of years. Um, the, the bulk of the company is split between two main sites. You've got our site in Boston, which is very much um, our R&D and sub-scale sub, um, cell development. So a lot of the founding sort of technologists at Form uh, were heavily linked to MIT. So a lot of the science was sort of linked to the, the you know, to academic Sounds institute. good, doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds really good saying that. It does. Um, and so that's actually based in a part of Boston called Somerville. And so as I said, that's where all of our cell development is done. Um, and then all of that testing and performance data is taken from there to our site in Berkeley, California, which is our systems engineering and productization. Essentially, take that and also terrible for talent that area as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, there is good reason to it, right? Because like Boston is great for that sort of scientific, academic sort of research to be able to sort of do all that cell development, and then we've got great systems engineering talent in that part of the world because of you know all of the amazing companies that are there, and that's where we take all of the everything that we've learned 
out of the Boston area and then sort of build it up at a production scale and a module scale and sort of build our first enclosures. We then have a site in near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is our sort of pilot manufacturing facility where we test out manufacturing techniques that think about how we can get to high volume levels and keep coming down that cost curve. But I think the most important and really exciting thing for us is over Christmas time, we announced the site of our first high volume manufacturing facility, which is going to be in a small town called Weirton, West Virginia. Wow. So made in America. Yeah, very much so. And can I ask you, so we've got 400 people in this company. Um, there's a there's a there's a lot there's a lot happening a lot of R and D a lot of you know commercial building stuff there's a lot of activities, um, but that's quite an investment right a financial investment to get this thing off the ground. Mm-hmm. So so who's back to you guys so far and um, who owns the company? So there's a range of investors. Um, some of some big names that we all know. So TPG ArcelorMittal is one of our sort of major strategic investors. Uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, okay, uh, a number of sort of big clients, sort of energy transition investors in the sort of California area as well. And um, do you guys have systems out there in the wild that are currently doing the hundred-hour uh, long-ish but not seasonal duration hundred-hour dispatch uh, model? So we have a we've built our first module and sort of put it into a closure in our site in Berkeley. We have not built a full system yet. That will go. Our first system will go live with a client in twenty twenty four. And where, where's that? So that our first sort of sub- it secret. No, there are so we have three public um, projects that are named. So our first one is with a the second biggest utility in Minnesota called Great River Energy. Yeah, yeah. That's very much a sort of what you consider a sort of pilot scale. That's one point five megawatt, one hundred and fifty megawatt hours, and then we have two other. Whoa, 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 whoa! Let's do the map. This is one point five megawatts and one hundred and fifty megawatt hours. Yeah, I mean, it's a scale. You know what? This is scale is kind of crazy. So we we have just announced um, two other projects with a, a utility called XL Energy, which is yeah. again for two projects, one in Colorado and one again, another one in Minnesota. Both will be 10 megawatts, one gigawatt hour each. And so- Wow, the, the numbers really add up fast with long yeah. duration, don't they? So this will be a, with those two projects, which will be two gigawatt hours of storage, that in itself from a storage pers- perspective is bigger than the total amount of storage deployed in the UK market. So. The numbers do add up very, very quickly. But if you're used to the lithium world where everything's on a pound per megawatt or dollar megawatt yeah. value because everything's one, two, three, four yeah. hours, it kind of breaks your head a little bit, it right? It does. And I think it's, there are many, I've, you know, coming out of the lithium world, I've had to sort of rework my head in terms of looking at these batteries and fundamentally understanding what they're doing. You're recovering from the <laughs> lithium world. Sounds like you've, you've made a breakthrough, man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, these assets are fundamentally very different. They are... Uh, you know, when you actually look at the type of storage you need to provide that firm capacity when it is needed, by all metrics of what a lithium battery looks like, we're building, you know, what could conceivably be a bad battery, right? Like there are many things that you look at, you know, it's got a bigger footprint, there's a round to efficiency is very different compared to lithium ion, but you're fundamentally building a battery that is for a different purpose. It is for these low cycling sort of resource adequacy needs. Well, let's do the top trumps, right? Let's do yeah. the top trumps. So we've got lithium, which is, you need less space. It's high, um, and less footprint, if you yeah. like, comes in 40 foot containers, pretty cheap, really, in the grand scheme of things, um, and high power, but not as long duration mm-hmm. by any means. Mm-hmm. But round trip efficiency, somewhere in the late 80s, early mm-hmm. 90s, yeah. percentage terms. So yeah. for every kilowatt hour you put in, you probably get, let's say, let's, let's be uh, nice round numbers, you get 90, uh, point, 90% of that back. Yeah. What what does that look like for a, for a rust battery? Should I call it? What's it actually called? So it's the the chemistry is called iron air. Iron air batteries. What's that like for an iron air battery or your iron air battery? Iron air battery. Just to go back to your one point there on lithium, it is cheap on a sort of on a power basis. But if you were to build that out to sort of multiple and multiple hours, then the cost begins to yes, stack up. Yeah. So again, it is cheap for the application that it is doing. It is not suitable because it would get very very expensive very quickly. Yeah. To start going beyond the sort of four or six hours yes. that it's sort of currently doing. We are operating around about the 40% round trip efficiency mark. And I think one of the interesting things we found out when you were doing all of this modeling in the early stages before we down selected our chemistry was to understand what is, what does this specification need to look like before we go in there? And one of the key things we found out early on was like, CapEx is a far more bigger lever that we need to pull than round trip efficiency. Because fundamentally what we are trying to deal with is 
how to uh, store huge oversupplies of renewables at certain times. Basically. Well, I was going to ask you about that, right? So any, this is, it's a bit like the hydrogen storage model, although 40%, I think, is much higher than you can do with yeah. <laughs> uh, hydrogen storage. Don't let me go down another hydrogen rabbit hole on this <laughs> podcast, please. It's fine, um, so 40%, that, sound, that sounds more reasonable. Um, but yeah, the, you do have to assume a big overbuild out of renewables for that to make sense, right? Yes, yeah. yes. And I think I think that's a fairly safe assumption. Like in every sort of forecast you look in, different, uh, you know, whether you're looking at National Grid Future Energy scenarios or Bloomberg Force, every forecast you're looking at, right, there is a huge overbuild, right? So, you know, whatever. What is the peak demand of UK as well? I used to be 60, I think it's like 55 gigs or something like now. You know, in any sort of story you look, we're building, we're going to have hundreds of gigawatts of renewable generation on our system to be able to deliver around the clock service. So yeah, I think our our peak demand numbers on, on our on our long term model, which um, we haven't actually released yet, and probably shouldn't talk about. But yeah, we've got a long term long term model coming out. This wasn't a plug, but it is now. Please do check it out when it comes out. Um, I think we're about 70 gigs of peak demand okay. by 2050. Something like yeah. that. It's, it's a lot. So yeah. the, the peak demand is going to go up, yeah. but build out is going to go up. Um, and let's hope that we can use systems like Form Energies to charge batteries long duration rather than paying wind to switch off, which is the uh, it's it's just such a bad situation that we have to do that. Yeah, and I, but it's like, you know, we've really fo- on the system we've really focused on building out that sort of generation sort of the side of the problem, uh, and we've done that you know really well comparably to many places in the world. But yes, we are at a we are at a point now, which is fundamentally why you know I've come to join Form Energy at this moment in time because we are at a point now where even if. Uh, the sort of demand supply imbalance is still much more targeted around that intraday problem. We do, we are already seeing huge problems at a transmission level from a sort of curtailment issue and constraint management, you know. Uh, we did a piece of work actually for National Grid ESO a couple of years ago where we, they gave us forecast boundary flows over the, some, of, some of their main congested areas and we sort of did a bit of a technology evaluation of what would be the different technologies that could help relieve those problems. And I think it was on the B7 boundary or B6, I forget which one. The um, I think it was the B7. We uh, top of England, Scotland yeah, area. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The, that um, by 2025, at least 20 percent of all curtailed energy would be for long for periods of longer than 100 hours. So this would be we are not very far away from seeing these types of events last for considerable periods of time, which means it is far more cost effective for us to deploy our technology than it is reinforce the network in certain places. Yes, although um, that's not the only solution, right? right? There are a number of solutions. So, so the the the, the iron air battery has got to compete with a load of other potential solutions, mm-hmm. ranging from other long duration solutions like flow batteries, who have got they seem to be doing you know, flow battery companies seem to be doing pretty well right now mm-hmm. in the long duration space. And then there's the big pumped hydro stuff that takes a while to build. Mm-hmm. Then there's the idea that we sort of just keep burning some fossil fuels to those periods. It depends how often it's going to be. So there's, there's a whole thing to play out. How how do we get around? So 40% round trip efficiency, mm-hmm. is it enough? How much overbuild do you have to assume for 40% to make sense? And how much, what, to, you know, what, what impact must that have on the spread of prices you've got to capture? So again, I'd start from the point of view, and there's a few things you mentioned there, but start from the point of view is when we actually did a lot of our modeling, right, as I said, the most important lever for us was CapEx, how we could continually bring that down. So most of the people at Form Energy right now are focused on keeping that performance stable whilst thinking about lots of different ways that we can bring down the, our sort of CapEx cost at a pounds per kilowatt hour level. So absolutely, 40% is a round to efficiency that we see in loads of different markets around the world that if we get to our target cost price, will be deployed in large sort of gigawatts in scale. Okay. Um, we actually sort of even now are looking at models in the UK whereby we are looking at certain sites that are in heavily congested areas and by sort of making certain assumptions around getting being able to charge up the battery with zero marginal cost power, we are already seeing spreads that make this battery look like a sort of an investable proposition. So this is now. So as you move through time, as you bring Scott Wind on board, you know, there's like 25 gigs of offshore wind that's going to come on in Scotland over the next sort of 10 years or so. We're going to be in a very, very different place. Yeah, so yeah. that, and I think, I always come back to this point of view. Like this, even you just look at the UK, right? But this is a global issue, right? We're a global company. That the sheer scale of investment that is needed across our entire space in terms of renewables and storage and network infrastructure, uh, there is a space for lots of our technologies to play. Like I don't think there is necessarily a winner takes all. There is win. not. No, I agree. Um, it, 
So the um, how I need to change my thinking, my frame of reference around round trip efficiency because I always get hung up on round trip efficiency. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's bigger than that. You know, there's you know, capex plays a big part, as mm. you as you said. And doing lithium ion over 100 hours is is just basically uh, nonsensical, right? No. Um, for a load of different reasons, not just the capex. So longer duration, the the trade off is you go longer duration, but you get less round trip efficiency. Generally, it seems mm. on all of these potential solutions. Mm. And so, how do I change my frame of reference? Because you must have done it coming out of the lithium as a reformed recovering lithium <laughs> dude. And now you're completely cool with this 40% round trip efficiency thing. So how do I do? How do I get there in my head? Because it must make sense because you've done it, and there's thousands of people working on this kind of stuff. H how do I get there? What should I be thinking? Uh, firstly, that I think you sort of used the word about trade-offs. Like there's lots of trade-offs in all of these different. Areas. We're constantly looking about trade-offs of how we make the sort of the optimal system to enable us to fundamentally get us to that net zero world in the cheapest possible way. But I just, it's, it goes to what I said already. You, it is fundamentally built on our ability to charge up the battery using energy that would either be curtailed because fundamentally there's not enough sort of capacity on the network, or we are in a place of sort of massive oversupply and there's not enough demand on the system to take it. So all of these types of storage technologies are predicated on the fact that there is, we are moving into a world in a relatively short time frame where that is going to happen. I mean, I remember sort of looking at uh, certain models when we were sort of, and I was looking at the lithium world, where we were looking at sort of two hour revenue models for sort of 10 to 15 year offtake agreements. And within sort of within this decade, it was due to in some certain forecasts, we will have enough offshore wind to service demand for multiple days on end within this decade. So that there already means you're going to get sort of that volatility is going to shift from a within day problem that will be flat for a couple of days, essentially. So we're not that far away from these types of patterns beginning to emerge. And so that's where, and I just want to be careful with my words, that's where round trip efficiency becomes less of an issue because again, you're not cycling the battery as much. Round trip efficiency is very important when you're cycling the battery multiple times because you're not losing as much energy. When you're cycling the battery anywhere between five to 10 times a year properly, uh, round trip efficiency becomes way less of an, a problem. I think I understand now. So the, so the frame of, reference and thinking is that we're, we're moving to a world of flatter peaks so longer duration peaks longer duration um, bottoms if you like in prices yeah and those are pretty chunky spreads and they're sustained for long long yeah. durations so like for instance when you look at sort of um when we've done a few models again for building out the revenue case in the uk and you look at state of charge profiles out throughout time the sort of they get fatter and wider, like sort of the, the sort of at that state of charge uh, profile will get they'll get longer and they get fatter and they get higher essentially. So throughout time, as then more and more renewables come online, those cycling those patterns become bigger and more protracted essentially. As those prices, as the way you said it explained, they become sort of flatter for periods of time and peakier, and so that it really you can see the story being told in the state of charge profile over a period of time, and you do incrementally a bit more cycles year on year as you grow renewables. I just can't help but think that interconnect is going to eat up all of those spreads, right? But then I every time I think about the future of the energy system, full stop in the UK and Europe, I always come back to this problem of how many interconnectors we're going to have and how are they going to connect to all the different countries because whatever model you put together uh when you try and model the interconnector uh in interconnectors you could just get assumptions upon assumptions right it becomes very very tricky it does and i think again you know we start from the premise that there are many different solutions we need to get yeah. there and again there's not a one winner takes all uh, I will, one thing I do get really excited about form is we can deliver at scale in a pre 2030 time horizon so we can get sort of large volumes out there and I do think uh, we're in a position now whereby one of the really interesting things about the benefits of, I'll get to the interconnected with it thing in a second but one of the really interesting things about the benefits of our technology is uh, when you sort of hit our cost targets that we we can achieve you have a fundamentally different technological makeup of the sort of cheapest cost pathway to net zero. And what I mean by that is you end up not overbuilding renewables as much. You end up mm. not overbuilding networks as much. You not end up overbuilding short duration. So you get to cheaper overall system build over altogether, which is one of the sort of very nice, exciting things about our technology. And that's those, very cool. That's the big story, right? It's a really big story. And that's that's a sort of policy story, right? Because that's the sort of why this is important that we need to lay that landscape that, you know, as a 
you know, a dev- an energy developer, you know, you're sort of thinking, what are the returns on my asset going to be? But you are kind of interested in the total market size of your particular sort of asset class. And there is potentially impacts on how that works. Why I say that is because the sooner we get doing it, the cheap, the more those savings are, right? The, the, the longer we wait, the more we have to spend. And so there is a sort of, and so that's one of the things that excite me that we can deliver at scale when interconnectors, unfortunately, take a very long time to happen. I would also say, and again, the modeling is super hard here, so I'm not going to be too prophetic. Oh, by the way, I was not expecting an answer on what was going to happen with interconnectors and prices because, I mean, we're going around this internally. Yeah. It's, it's it's weeks and weeks and weeks of work. It's, it's really hard. And I, it's, I, but I would say is that theoretically that they will at certain times work with you and they will certain times work against you because essentially you, you will get these weather patterns that you will essentially be experiencing the same weather pattern that the other country will be. Now, they will not directly correlate and they could be sort of helping you a bit, but it, I don't think it will be as sort of as simple as we've got no wind, get it in from mm. northern Germany. They've got no wind, get it in from us. That would be very elegant, but I think there is space for a lot of us. So what does, a um, for form energy, what does your ideal market look like because you're expanding in Europe right now you've got people on the ground here and I'm sure we're going to see some form energy systems on the ground at some point so what does a good market for this 100 hour iron air battery look like I'm I'm, I'm sensing that it's a high penetration uh, high penetration of renewables Mm -hmm. Um, what else is key for that market can you make some examples yeah so I think I mean it's reality like it's you know I've come from the lithium world and so where you see a buoyant lithium market, you know, in some ways it's the bellwether for when a, for when a long duration market's going to, the long duration does follow short duration. It's just the, we're seeing that volatility play out for different technology times at different time periods. Um, so yeah, high penetration of renewables, a policy landscape that is looking to uh, retire certain legacy thermal assets. Um, and again, UK is, you know, there's, there's a reason why me and you have been in jobs in the UK. It is an amazing market for energy storage just because of its island nature as well. Brings in place a sort of a, a additional sort of challenge that sort of um, creates more volatility than perhaps in other markets that are more interconnected with their sort of neighboring countries. So those are good markets for us at a sort of fundamental level. Then what is really interesting, I think, to talk about is our first four projects which are with them um, so there's two with excel one with great river energy and one with uh, georgia power what's interesting there is they are all with in parts of america there where they have vertically integrated public utilities so some of the kind of parts of the world which are you know generation transmission distribution yeah. and retail and what the is good old days yes good exactly old day. did, i still say to this day it makes sense yeah i mean there's so many yeah, ways to cut costs. I feel, a bit, I feel a bit disingenuous talking about the CEGB. I don't know how old I was when that no. was operating. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but fundamentally, there you have got a policy landscape where these people are looking to maintain a level of service reliability when you've got growing renewables and you've got a policy mandate to retire certain thermal plants. And so a lot of our projects are actually on the sites of ex well, which will be former coal plants. Um, and they internalize all of the different parts of the value stack that we know. And so the value proposition is we are fundamentally helping them model their entire portfolios and helping them look at what's a least cost build pathway at a portfolio level to a certain carbon emissions ob- objective. And that's how we sort of you know, get really good traction there. In Europe, it's very different, yes. <laughs> so safe, safe to say, whereby, you know, we have a deregulated market and it's unbundled. And therefore, you know, I feel a little bit like I did at the beginning of the lithium world where we are teasing our way out, like looking for what are the different, what is it going to be the different revenue stacks that is going to make this a sort of fundamentally a bankable asset class. Um, What's clear to me is that as an asset class that I think what's clear to me is as you move from a system that is dominated by fuel costs to one that is dominated by the capex, so upfront costs, the way you reduce overall system cost, which is good for society, is to reduce the cost of capital. And the way you reduce the cost of capital is to give visibility of long-term revenue streams. Now that can come in many different flavors, right? It can come in firming PPAs. It could come in some sort of resi- sort of strategic reserve or resiliency contracts. It could come in many different flavors. We are sort of working across the board in lots of different areas, but one area where we see an immediate need uh, in a sort of pre-2030 time horizon is the one I was talking about, how we can provide a uh, cost-effective way for transmission support to relieve their growing problem. Because it is a problem, you know, you, you only have to look at the scaling costs of National Grid for curtailment. They have the very same problem in Ireland. They actually have a 
bigger problem in Ireland. Actually, if you look at the costs in Ireland of sort of their wind curtailment, they're kind of almost comparable to the UK and it's a much smaller market. Yeah. So those are the areas whereby we're having a lot of interest in terms of either co-locating with wind, sort of onshore wind farms or sort of looking at sort of pure play storage projects that are looking to uh, work to yeah, no, fundamentally sort of reduce transmission congestion. And we're having those conversations around Europe. All right. We, we've got to talk about the IRA for a second. So the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which is, in simple terms, a huge generation of cash um, from the US government towards a load of different things, but a big chunk of that is renewables and smart grid technologies and all the things that we, we're very excited by. And so as an American company with a big footprint in the US and storage as being a, a, key, a key part of that, what does that mean for form energy? I mean, I can, I'm, I'm sure it's good news, uh, but how good news? So I think at this point, it is important to say that everything we are doing, everything I've spoken about in the last you know, half an hour or so, was happening before the Inflation Reduction Act bill. So fundamentally, we had made huge progress in terms of developing the technology out of the lab and sort of in sort of performing at the level we needed to perform to hit our cost targets and performance targets at a production scale. We had already secured the capital that we would have needed to done to build our first high volume manufacturing plant. I actually came on board at Form before the IRA was announced. So we were already gonna be launching in Europe. So I think it's important to say that we had made a lot of progress already. Now. It is, okay, I, I, I'm hearing loud and clear. You don't need the IRA. I get that message. So we were fixing a problem that needed fixing, and we had a really great product market fit pre the IRA. It does enable us to go faster and harder in terms of our manufacturing plans to sort of ramp up and get down that cost curve as quickly as possible. Um, all I would say is one sort of sort of interesting thing about our technology is that because it uses a lot of iron, it's very heavy. So we don't like we don't want to be shipping it too much. Uh-huh. So reality is, is we will be locating manufacturing in every major continent in the world in terms of how we will service local supply, sort of markets. And so we will look be looking to put manufacturing in Europe, you know, in a not too sort of distant time frame to be able to service our European needs. And I think it's also probably worth saying, you know, the IRA has benefited a very broad range of technologies, not just us. So um, manufacturing in Europe, that's exciting. Do you know where? Can I, can I push you on where? <laughs> no. You, you're, doing, you're doing the whole the Elon Musk gigafactory decision where um, going and meeting politicians and shaking hands and figuring out where it makes sense the most. Uh, no, it's too early for us to say that. Okay. So now to the last two uh, questions. The first one is quite a simple one. If you want something to plug, if you've got a press release or something you think that people need to know about, now's your chance. And then the second one is a bit more complicated. This is, what do you believe that's a contrarian view? What do you have to believe about the world? Or what do you believe that not necessarily everybody else believes, um, either you as, as David or as Form Energy? Yeah. So is there anything you want to plug? I think the thing I wanted to plug, I've already made pretty clear, is which is it is an incredibly exciting time to be at the company as we sort of ramp up our ability to start commercializing our, commercializing our technology at scale. So the announcement of our big, uh, high volume manufacturing site is a huge step for us, right? Like we will not deliver what we need to do unless we rapidly come down our cost curve to our target cost, which we know when we do the modeling, there is gigawatts and multiple gigawatts of demand for our product. I was in uh, on the site uh, sort of about a month or so ago in West Virginia, and it's hard not to be inspired about seeing, you know, bring a huge amount of jobs back to a sort of a place where there used to be a steel mill. So it's a very exciting time in terms of seeing us go through that process. Contrarian thoughts, interesting. Um, One area that we do see, and it's something I actually began to recognize in my previous career when I was at Open Energy, was that uh, increasingly, you know, a lot of the world in which we navigate is determined by the forward curves of many different sort of consultancies of how they look at different power systems evolving. And I think we, we see that doing things the way we used to do them might might need to change in terms of how we think about future markets because and I, I mean this is more for like grid planning infrastructure than it is for necessarily sort of revenue modeling because fundamentally looking at things using simple heuristics or looking at sort of average weather years is increasingly putting getting us in a world which just doesn't make sense when mm. you've got you know very weather driven um, grids and i don't think people 100 percent agree with this i don't think you people realize what weather driven grids mean like we can't look at sort of a typical year. We need to understand variability hour to hour, day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year, yet things change, right? 
I think, was it like 2020 had like 14% less wind than 2021. That's materially a different amount of capacity that's on our system just going from year to year. And so we see a bit of a, a step change needed in how we model our systems because to build out that optimal technological landscape to give us the cheapest pathway, we need to be a bit more cognizant of that variability and sort of look at different weather conditions and how that would impact our sort of optimal technological landscape. I couldn't agree more. I mean, there's so many of, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine, but we, 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 a lot of our, the industry's modeling, it used to be, does the spark spread make sense, right? Uh, and what does the future look like for my generating asset? And now so much of future technologies are dependent on, well, they make sense in a volatility-led world rather than an absolute price world. Mm -hmm. And that is a different way to look at the modeling problem full stop. It's a, way to, it's a different way to look at the future um, grid and energy system completely. And uh, yeah, I 100% agree with you. We, we, we really do have to approach this differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of models to build. Yeah. And so with that, I'm going to say thanks for coming on. Um, great conversation. If you're listening to this, please do hit all the buttons, like, subscribe. And if you hit five stars, you do get a goodie bag. And see you next time. Thank you very much.